Uh, you have your Bibles, turn to Zechariah chapter 6. I want to bring a word to you this morning, and it'll be uh, relatively shorter than some of these messages that we've looked at in Zechariah, um, because this is, uh, this is the second time we've looked at angels, and we looked at them in a uh, great deal. Uh, and under the first vision that Zechariah had, um, but Zechariah chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 as our text this morning. And uh, even before we read it, uh, I'd just like to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today, and Lord, we lift up Stoney and, and Levon, and Lord, I, there's a couple of your, your children that, uh, unless you intervene, are going to see you very soon. Lord, as we commit them to you, we pray for your peace uh, to overflow with their loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them. Pray for Karen today as well as she's uh, hurting and for others that need your healing touch, Lord. We, we know that you will extend your, your right hand of power and majesty to them, Lord, and, and touch them. Accomplish your purposes in, in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1, I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot black horses, and in the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro uh, through the earth. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. And may the Lord add his blessing to his word this morning. When we started the series on Zechariah and we began to look at these visions, uh, I, I believe that God had led us to that place for such a time as this. Because as we, as we look back at those visions, we saw, first of all, the angels in vision one, and we saw them coming. And now we're going to see them going in this vision today. But then the second vision, you remember, we talked about those horns. They are earthly powers that got their power from the prince of the power of the air. And what we see in our nation and what we saw was evil moving upon our nation and in, in, in impacting people who were in places of, of power. And, you know, the evil that has spread across our country is something that is definitely demonic. It has a power outside of its own. But you remember then how we talked about these carpenters, and we had Carpenter Sunday, and you all came dressed up as carpenters, because it is the carpenters that actually terrify these powers. Those carpenters are you and I. We have the power to break those horns and to break that connection between the principalities and powers of the air and the people on earth. That is our job as carpenters. And we're gonna, I'm excited about that because we have, we have some things that we want to share about that even more today and what we can do about that. And we talked uh, the last several weeks on this barrel of wickedness and how wickedness was put in a barrel and a lid was placed on that barrel. And we talked about how you and I, the Christian, the church, is the restraining power of evil on this earth. And it's my prayer that we can join together even before we leave here today and put wickedness in the barrel and say, wickedness, you depart from our land. We don't want wickedness in our land. We want righteousness in our land. We don't want lies and deceit to prosper, but we want God's truth to prosper. Because we know that when truth is proclaimed, people are set free from that. 
And we have this power, and, and I believe we have the responsibility uh, to do that today. So let's put wickedness in the barrel, and let's send it out of America. And, and now we come to, to angels, and we're going to look at to them today about how angels can help us in all of this. And I don't, you know that I'm not some spooky uh, kind of Christian, but I do believe in the power of angels, and uh, they are there, and they are there to work the power of God and to, and to help his purposes along, and they are there with us at different times as to, um, now many of the the uh, current best-selling angel books contain legend, lore, and outright occultism in regard to angels. And they pay little attention to what God's Word actually says and teaches on the subject. And in this uh, time together this morning, we want to discover what the Scripture says about angels and some of the important ways that God uses angels to minister to believers and how they patrol the earth and the things that they work to accomplish. In the process today, I pray that your faith may be in God may be increased because of his mighty provision for your life and that your faith in him and his working in your life would be strengthened. Now in chapter 1, Zechariah sees these riders and they come in on horses. And they are, they, he is told that they had come to and fro through the earth and they were sent from the Lord. Turns out they were not men. They were not men at all. They were angels. They are the angelic patrollers of planet earth. They do surveillance around the earth. The one who is in charge is not just an angel, but he is the angel of the Lord. It's the one that we know as Jesus. It's the pre-incarnate manifestation of the word becoming flesh. And when the Old Testament uses the word angel to refer to Christ, the, the word indicates not a created being like other angels, but really it is true to the meaning of angel itself, which is simply a messenger. So Jesus Christ becomes a messenger and he is the Lord of the host of heaven, the host of the army of angels. Now in vision one, angels are coming. In vision eight, they are going. And, and this vision takes place, I believe, at sunup. If you just to read the text there in the mountains where the color of bronze, it's been a long night for Zechariah. He has had eight visions, seven prior to this, and now he comes to the eighth one, it's almost over. It is the last vision. He has this at sunrise. Well, let me talk uh, some more about angels here, uh, just to lay some foundation. Because in ancient times, a, a, a name or a title was a, a, a statement that revealed something about the person bearing it. So the name angel, the title for them in scripture tells us a lot about their function how they operate in God's universe. Angels are called the sons of God because they were directly created by God. Angels are called ministering spirits because they serve human beings in various ways. They provide protection, guidance, encouragement, and deliverance. Angels are called God's heavenly host because they function as God's heavenly army, employed as a military force to accomplish his will and engage in his battles. Angels are called God's host because as bodyguards surround their prince, they adorn his majesty and, and render uh, him conspicuous. Like soldiers, they are ever intent upon their leader's standard and they are ready and able to carry out his commands. As soon as he beckons, they gird themselves for work, or rather I think they are already girded, they're already at work. Whenever God says to them, I want you to do something, they are, they are ready to do it. Dressed and ready for battle. Dressed and ready to deliver the message. Angels are called holy ones because they are set apart from God and they are set apart to serve God. In scripture, angels are most often described in relation to God as his angels. For example, in Psalm 104 and verse 4, it says he makes his angels as winds, his ministers a flaming fire. And then two angels 
specifically are mentioned in the Bible by name, Michael and Gabriel, emphasizing this relationship with God with that L ending, which in Hebrew means God. So Michael means who is like God, and Gabriel means mighty one of God. So angels are God's angels, and they exist, exist to carry out his purposes. Some angels are called watchers. I like this. They're called watchers because of their unique role in observing what is transpiring on planet Earth. Do you know that there are angels that are watching over planet Earth? There are angels that are watching over you today. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 13 says, I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and there was a holy watcher coming down out of heaven. This brings great encouragement to, the, to me. There are angels in heaven that watch over earth, and there are times when they come down to earth to accomplish God's purposes. The term suggests that these angels are especially vigilant in their activity of watching over the affairs of the earth. Whatever is going on on earth today, and there is a lot, there are angels watching, and they know what is going on. Uh, and, and the word watcher in the biblical Hebrew communicates the idea of being vigilant, making sleepless watch, to be wakeful, and on the watch. We could say that these are God's reconnaissance agents. So what do angels do? Three things quickly this morning. Number one, they act as God's ministers. Hebrews 1.14 says that the angels, many angels, by the way, there are many angels. There are innum innumerable uh, company of angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. But what do, what are some ways that angels minister to heirs of salvation? Now, please understand this this morning. Scripture teaches that the angels are ministering spirits to send to those who are heirs of salvation. It doesn't mean that they are going to minister to those who are not believers. Now, do they? I think they do. But, the, but that's not required of them in Scripture. They are mainly sent to help you and I, those of us who are heirs of salvation. Now, let's look at some examples here. Uh, God may use angels to answer a believer's prayer. Certainly, God does not have to depend on angels in order to answer the prayers of his people. In fact, oftentimes, he answers prayers without angelic involvement. Nevertheless, God sometimes sovereignly chooses to use angels when answering people's prayers. In uh, Acts chapter 12, we find Peter, Peter is wrongfully imprisoned. And we read that while Peter was in, in jail, while Peter was in prison, the church, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That's verse 5. And what happened next all of a sudden, an angel appears to Peter's, comes into his prison cell, and helps him escape. And suddenly, the scripture tells us that the angel of the Lord approached him, and a light shone in that prison, and Peter is resting in the Lord so soundly here that the angel has to smite him to wake him up. I mean, you talk about resting in the Lord. He, he's going to be executed as far as he knows the next day, but he's at complete rest. And the angel says, Peter, rise up quickly, and the chains just fall off his hands. He's changed to these four quadrants of, of uh, Roman guards. The chains just break free. And the angel says to him, get dressed, Peter. Get your shoes on, get your sandals on, and we're going to break out of here. And Peter is in this half days, I think. You know, he's still partly asleep, but he does what the angel says. And he, he says, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And he didn't even know what was done by the angel was real. He says, this is just a, just a dream or a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guards, they came to the iron gate leading to the city, which also just happened to open by itself. And they went out and forward down one street, and immediately the angel left him. Now, I like this. Peter goes to the house where the church is praying. 
and he knocks on the door, and one of the servant girls by the name of Rhoda opens that door. She sees that it's Peter, and she slams the door in his face and runs back inside and says, hey, you're not going to believe this, but God is answering our prayer, and Peter is outside. He's, Peter is at the door. What do they say? You're crazy. <laughs> you're, you're insane. You must have seen his ghost. You must have seen his angel. You know, this is a great encouragement to me because sometimes when I don't even have the faith to believe that what I'm praying for, God is sovereign and he, and he answers that prayer anyway. And sometimes all we need is a little mustard seed of faith, right? If we can just get a mustard seed of faith, God says we can move mountains. So here uh, he is, and clearly this is an example of Christians praying to God and God immediately responding by dispatching an angel to answer that request. And we must assume that God still answers prayers this way today. When we petition the throne of God with a request, God may grant that request by assigning a specific angel uh, to bring it about. Sometimes they give us encouragement in times of danger in Acts 27, uh, verses 23 through 24. Paul said, There stood by me this night the angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And look, God has given you all those who sail with you. This is a great encouragement because they thought they were all going to drown that night because they were in a hurricane. But God sends an angel to Paul and says, Don't be afraid, Paul. My desire, my sovereign will is for you to stand before Caesar. And you are going to do it. And by the way, not one person is going to lose their life through it all. Angels also are guardians of God's people. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse uh, 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Billy Graham says, For every true believer in Christ should be encouraged and strengthened. Angels are watching. They mark your path. They superintend all the events of your life and protect the interest of the Lord God, always working to promote his plans and to bring about his highest will for you. And indeed, Graham says, if we would only realize how close his ministering angels are, what calm assurance we could have in facing the cataclysms of life. While we do not place our faith directly in angels, we should place it in the God who rules the angels, then we can have peace. Angels take care of the believer at the moment of death. In Luke 16, 22, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's presence. The host of heaven stands at attention as we awake from, from earth to glory. And Satan's BB guns are no match for God's heavy artillery. Some have called death the great equalizer. Regardless of whether a person is a man or a woman, rich or poor, thick, thick or thin, black or white, all humans are equal and that they all eventually die. For the Christian, we know that God has taken the sting out of death. Death is simply a trans transition during which our spirit leaves our physical bodies and the real person enters directly into the presence of Christ. So in that way, then, death becomes a glorious event. Ron Rhodes uh, said, perhaps one of the most meaningful ministries angels have to us as believers that at the very moment of death, they accompany, accompany us into heaven. When that glorious separation of the spirit from the body takes place, the angels are there to personally escort us into e our eternal inheritance. The angels will give us a royal welcome as we enter the presence of God. And Billy Graham describes the glory of what awaits the believer in the next life. He said, the wonders, beauty, splendor, and grandeur of heaven will be yours. You will be surrounded by these heavenly messengers sent by God to bring you home where you may rest from your labors and through the honor of your works who will follow you. Now, most people generally walk by sight and not by faith. That is, they, they live their lives and interpret reality according to what is tangible to them, what they can see physically, what they can experience in the physical realm. 
Of course, if we limit our understanding of reality to the physical world, we remain ignorant to the vast world of the invisible spirits that are around us. And we see a number of examples in the Bible that illustrate how people don't perceive angels. And just because you may not perceive an angel doesn't mean that, that angel, there's not an angel there, that an angel does not exist. I mean, you look at Balaam, one of the most incredible stories to me in all the Bible is Balaam is riding along. He's out of the will of God. He's going to try to curse the nation of Israel, and he's riding on his donkey, and all of a sudden, the donkey stops because the donkey sees an angel with a drawn sword. What does Balaam do? He beats his donkey. He said, donkey, you are an embarrassment to me. You are embarrassing me. But that donkey stopped, and he headed off into the field. The angel of the Lord meets up with Balaam again. And the donkey this time stops, and actually he's between uh, two walls, and he rubs up against that wall, and it hurts Balaam's foot. And what does Balaam do? He beats the donkey again. Third time they're going, and this time the angel stands at a place where there's nowhere for that donkey to go. And so the donkey just kind of falls down, bows down. What does Balaam do? He beats the donkey again, and the donkey speaks to him. And Balaam starts arguing with the donkey. <laughs> I mean, at some point, wouldn't you realize that something's not right here? I mean, this donkey is talking to me, and what am I doing? I am arguing with this donkey. And finally, the donkey has to talk some sense into Balaam. And then God uh, allowed him to go on his mission. But he did not perceive the angel that was there. A donkey had more sense than he did, <laughs> and he didn't perceive it. There's Elijah's servant, Elisha's Elijah, servant, Gehazi. Uh, the, Gehazi goes outside early one morning, and he sees the Assyrian army filling their farmland, and he is scared to death, and he goes back in and to Elisha, and he said, we are surrounded <clears throat> by the enemy. And Elisha said, don't worry, there are more of us than there are of them. And Elisha alone perceived the presence of the heavenly host that had come to help. And he simply prayed that God would open the eyes of his servant so that he would see. By the way, when I picture the servant, I picture Don Knotts. I don't, I don't know why. I, I just picture Don Knotts. If you, if you don't know who Don Knotts is, go, you know, watch Mayberry RFD or something. But here, here he is, and, and he says, God, would you open his eyes that he might see? And Gehazi looks outside again, and he sees the Assyrian army, but he also sees what else? He sees the army of heaven. He sees the host of heaven, and they have surrounded the Assyrian army. And Elisha's servant knows that they are going to win the battle because truly there are more for them than there are against them. It's interesting, the Sadducees, who seem to walk more by sight than by faith, are the only group in the Bible who didn't believe in angels. And the, the, the uh, treatment of the apostles is assumingly ironic. In Acts chapter 15, verses 17 and 18, we read that the high priest and all his associates and who were members of the party of the, of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and they put, them, they put them in the public jail. But then you guessed it, you guessed it, an angel delivered them from jail. It says, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of that, that jail, that prison, and brought them out. He said, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. Do you get the humor in this? Here's a group of people who don't believe in angels. They have the apostles arrested, and the group, and the angels that they don't believe in rescue the apostles. I, I love that. And how the apostles then must have have smiled as they pondered God's humor and all of this. They are God's messengers. They are God's 
uh, messengers. I'm going to skip some of this here. Um, they speak and act according to his authority. And when they give us strength or enlightenment, it's really God's strength and enlightenment that they impart. The encouragement is God's encouragement. Their guidance is God's guidance. Their protection is God's protection. When they bring comfort, it's God's comfort they offer. And when they bring wrath, it is God's wrath that they inflict. But angels always act on behalf of God. They are God's military. Not only do they announce God's impending judgments, but they, they execute them. The angels surround the throne in heaven. And when we get to heaven, we will have fellowship face to face with God's holy angels. Perhaps we will learn that there were times when angels acted to restrain some evil from falling upon us. I believe they were working in our lives on a daily basis. We need to be thankful to God for his angelic ministry. Joining the angels' song one day, the voices of the saved will be joined with the voices of angels. Can you imagine that? Singing with the angels someday. Worship and praise to our eternal God and our glorious Savior. The book of Revelation describes the, what's going to happen there in great detail. But just imagine what it'll be like. A hundred million angels and untold millions of the redeemed praises and singing to God in harmony. I can't do it now, but there I'll be able to. I shiver just to hear a few dozen people sing a great anthem of praise to the Lord. But imagine what that's going to be like when we sing with unison in the, with the angels. Incredible. Incredible. Someday, God's angels are going to come and it's going to, they're going to separate the wheat from the chaff. They're going to separate the believer from the unbeliever. They're going to separate the true from the false. And my prayer is that you have committed your life to Jesus Christ and you are a part of his glorious kingdom. That when the angels call and when the angels come, you will be found that you were part of the real deal. You were the wheat. And you had been born again by the Spirit of God. If you have not done that, if you are, have not come to a place in your life where you have received Jesus, I can tell you that if you were to bow the knee today and to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord with your mouth, the angels in heaven will rejoice. The thing that they rejoice more than any other thing is that when a sinner has come home. And I would just like to ask you right now, for those that are watching, has Jesus Christ come into your heart, forgiven you of your sins, cleansed you from all unrighteousness? Has he done that for you? I tell you, he, he's done it, but you need to accept it. And you need to accept that pardon and let him apply his sacrifice to your life. Jesus, you died, but you died for me. You bled, but you bled so that your sins, my sins, could cover, could be covered by your blood. And when we appropriate his great work into our lives, we find that we become new creations in Christ and the angels in heaven rejoice. Let's bow our our hearts and our, our heads and, 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 and uh, just open our hearts to him this morning. And if you have never prayed to receive Christ, why don't you just do that right now? Father, I, I come to you now and I admit that I am a sinner. And I know that I need a savior. I acknowledge that I can never earn my way to heaven, but I accept Jesus as the Savior I need. I believe that he died and that he rose again for me. I receive the full pardon that he purchased for me on the cross. Thank you for saving me and allowing me to know you personally. In Jesus' name.
I pray. Amen. Accepting that pardon today cause the angels in heaven to rejoice. Since we have dinner on the grounds today, could, could we take a few more moments? I, I want us to pray for the election coming up. And this is the way I want us to pray today. I want us to pray that God would send his angels. I'm not kidding. I'm asking that we pray that God would send his angels. Angels are God's army. And one of the things that he wants to do is protect. And I think there's a number of things that need to be protected in this, in this election. We need our freedoms protected. We need protection from the, the potential riots and protests uh, that could be coming after the election. We need protection on the ballots that, that there wouldn't be fraud and that ballots wouldn't be lost, but these ballots would be protected. And so I, 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 I believe that we have, God has timed this, not anything that I've done, but this, we've finished this series right at this time where, where we're asking the angels who go out now, and we are gonna ask them to intervene, intervene on planet Earth, and in particular, the United States of America. They are already patrolling, they are already watching. Can we just join together and pray and ask them to act? Yes, Tanya. Absolutely. It, she said the occult practices and the witches that are trying to put curses upon this election, um, our president and, and things like that, we need protection. They need protection in that area as well. I, I think this is, a, this is a good time for us also to say, you know, wickedness, we're putting, a bar putting you in a barrel and we're putting a lid on it. We're going to cast you out of the land. So would you just come forward if you feel comfortable today? Would you come forward? Let's just stand at the altar today.